Well, thank you for showing up right before lunch. I'm sorry to say you have a forensic accountant between you and lunch, so hopefully we'll make this go quickly and it'll be informative. If not, just run away quietly. Um, my topic is FCPA enforcement trends, the US FCPA, so I know I'm in the wrong country for this, and please excuse me for that, and their impact on comp corporate compliance programs. So what we're going to talk about, hopefully today, rather briefly, since I don't have eight slides, I have 29 or 30, which again leads to the accountant in the room. I will give you a quick overview of the FCPA, which I will go very quickly because I know you guys know what it is. Uh, we'll look at some enforcement trends in 2016 and 17. Uh, the international harmonization of anti-bribery, anti-corruption programs across multiple jurisdictions. So we're getting closer to having the same thing apply globally, and which makes it much easier to sell a program, but also much harder to enforce a program. Uh, some hot topics in, uh, in corporate compliance programs. Um, continuous improvement opportunities, meaning on every standard you look at, including the ISO 3701, you've got to do continually improve and look for best practices. Most people uh, get you away from the paper tiger programs, which are, in, a, in essence, not very helpful for you or your organization. The U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, not so dissimilar to the Canadian Act, has two provisions. There's an anti-bribery provision, which basically says, please don't bribe. And then the more um, robust uh, provision of the program is the books and records provision. If the U.S. government, the SEC or the DOJ, cannot prove bribery or cannot get to that quid pro quo, most of the time they can get an organization by failure to maintain books and records and hit them in an internal control environment that would prevent or detect bribery. So you'll get caught by that method. So FCPA compliance policies and procedures. Um, the basically, it's all about addressing the general risk and exposure areas in your company and your compliance areas. And notice the spelling error there with a seven in compliance because you've got an accountant in front of you. So these are the basic components of, uh, or exposure areas in a compliance program. Nothing new here. I'm sure you're all very familiar with this. Uh, facilitation payments are allowed in Canada and the US. Most other places are eliminating them. So they're taking a very hard line. The UK Bribery Act being the main one that eliminated that. Um, some company profile. So you've got the general uh, compliance areas you're supposed to address. You're supposed to do this in the context of your organization. I'm sure you've heard context before. This morning I have at least four or five times now, um, multiple times in a couple of other uh, presentations. So you look at your non-U.S. regulatory activities if you're the U.S., um, your interactions with foreign government officials, uh, non-U.S. sponsors, which is a fancy way of saying third parties. In the U.S., or at least underneath the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, about 75% of the issues are, are, I would say, traced back to third parties. So anybody who tells you that is not a risk factor, really, you should be careful what they say next. Um, there's some certain compliance program elements we want to look at. The risk assessment is the only one that most people have difficulty doing. Um, because they really don't know all the areas of risk in their organization, all the compliance uh, program elements that they're subject to, all the jurisdictions that they're subject to. I was with a client not too long ago in the mining and mi minerals extraction area, which means they're in some not so nice places, or at least not on your vacation bucket list. And it took them over three months to figure out all the regulations they'd signed up to, meaning they had a, they had a presence in the jurisdiction, they were voluntarily complying with some uh, regulations, and all of the different reporting. So, <laughs> The matrices to find out where your risks lie is sometimes the art in this process, and it's just not a check the box exercise. Um, we've already, you've heard about helplines and hotlines and some of the other employee incentives and discipline. The employee incentives and discipline thing, I think uh, most people know up to, including termination, is the clause everybody likes to see for the US FCPA. Basically, employee incentives and discipline are the backside of tone at the top meaning we want to be a compliance organization, we're willing to terminate people who violate the tenor or the, the, um, the I don't want to say it improperly, but basically that you want to have the organization be compliant. It takes a lot of investment to do that, and it only takes a few people to mess it up, either locally or globally. So you want to have some ramifications to that. And most importantly for employees, the minute they feel like the level playing field has disappeared, you're now you created a rationalization for bribery and fraud, and you've opened yourself up to all kinds of exposure that you have to pay people like me to find. Not that I don't like being paid, mind you. So, what are some of the enforcement trends we're looking at in the US from the DOJ and the SEC? Geographically, and this is probably more about where the business is going than anything else, is China and Latin America. 
uh, and as your previous speaker just spoke, Latin America is a little risky just to begin with, and China is risky as well um, for the level of government interaction with business or state-owned entities, and um, necessarily the, what we will refer to colloquially as selective enforcement, <coughs> which means if you're in an industry or you're in an industry that's competing with a Chinese company, you might find yourself subject to an FCPA investigation or an anti-bribery, anti-corruption investigation as a business tactic. And that's uh, not something a lot of people want to hear. Uh, the collateral consequences. Um, there are a lot of um, joint activities going on. Aldebrecht, which is Lava Jato, which was mentioned also prior to today, uh, is a huge case. And other companies and corp I'm sorry, countries' regulators are finding out there's money to be had here. And this is a profit center. And then once that happens, uh, people start to share documents. And you get a little more cooperation, which is unusual and when you're trying to work with foreign governments. Uh, the investigative costs, which is the last thing there, are, are usually, and somebody mentioned this as well, they're dwarfed by the fines for the most part, unless you're all to brick and you paid a rather large fine. Collateral consequences, the U.S. DOJ has a pilot program. It's a voluntary disclosure incentives. Essentially, it's a way of calculating a discount off your fines and penalties. Uh, if you voluntarily disclose and participate in the investigation and you go after the individuals because the U.S. government is now really targeting personal responsibility with respect to this. So they're going after the corporation, but they really want to have the individuals responsible for. And unlike Canada, they don't have to be senior management, although more often than not they are because that's what sets the tone. Um, and then the monitor itself, which is a law firm usually supported by an accounting firm or someone like myself, it's a one to three year commitment. And that's not cheap either as we kind of go across the globe and analyze anything and everything to make sure that your compliance program is not a paper tiger and it's operating as intended. So the monetary impacts are increasing. I mentioned Olerec because it's probably the biggest part of a $6 billion gain if you're in the compliance group for a government this year. Um, it's the highest ever since the FCPA was enacted in 1977. 95% of those are a handful of companies, uh, the biggest which is Olerec, which is about $3.6 billion. Um, it speaks for itself. You do not want to subject your organization to these kinds of fines because, again, this is just a small part of the actual cost. Anybody who's experienced a monitor or a lawyer that likes to sit inside and become your general counsel for a while or pseudo general counsel will, uh, can attest to that. And here's where the sharing comes in. 3.6 billion of the 6 billion was shared with foreign governments. So all the U.S. led the case in cooperation with Brazil, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. We didn't take the largest piece. In fact, Brazil did. So this is where other governments are deciding that cooperation is the best way to address bribery and that most people who can facilitate this, this type of activity are global or multinational organizations. Here's the piece where we talk about individual impact. In the U.S., it's becoming more and more important to, to name the individuals, and we're going after high-level defendants, which means C-suites. Now, we'll also take in anybody who participated, but if you're, if you're sitting at the top of the organization and think plausible deniability is something that works for you, you really need to reconsider. Um, Ox Ziff, the CEO and the founder of the organization, was faced with a fine. So mid-year update, 18 enforcement actions in the U.S., 12 by the uh, DOJ and 6 by the SEC. Um, we know we have uh, Donald Trump as president, and I'll, I'll leave the political discussions for later. Uh, most of these started before he came into office, although there have been really no indications that the U.S. government is going to let up. Again, it's a profit center. It's good for uh, fighting global terrorism and supporting governments that don't necessarily agree with the U.S. or the rest of the first world. So there is an advantage on the law and order side, which I don't think the administration is going to step away from, and certainly not with Jeff, Jeff Sessions and some other folks that are still in their, in their jobs this week. Um, I mentioned SQM here, and it, it's an interesting matter. It had a relatively small fine at $30.5 million, uh, but there was no bribery proven, no quid pro quo, nothing. It was essentially a CEO who wanted to play politics and wanted to have people come visit him, and he wanted to pass out money to politicians and be important. He put it in his budget. He paid about, we couldn't link it, couldn't be done. However, the sloppy accounting, he was paying for papers that weren't delivered, studies that weren't delivered for political organizations and or uh, representatives, and that co cost the company a uh, monitorship, a couple-year investigation, and $30.5 million fine. 
One of the other things the U.S. government's really pushing is pilot programs or declinations. So this is where your compliance program uh, is able to prove the bad apple theory and that, hey, this was a one-off occurrence. Um, we shouldn't be penalized as an organization. We've got a robust compliance program, and the government actually agrees with us. Um, so that's happening. In February 2017, the DOJ um, also issued additional guidance. Their guidance is essentially a rehash of the 2012 guidance. However, it is now official that the DOJ is going to come after you with 11 topics, um, all of which are linked to compliance program elements, so it's not that much of a new issue. It's just they're really focusing on their investigation and making sure your compliance program contain all of the elements that are required, and they're pushing that. And now they've sort of made it official so that you have to pay attention to it now. When we talk about uh, ABC, ABAC, or anti-bribery, anti-corruption regulations, it's starting to see some harmonization across the globe. Um, some of the more recent things are the UK Bribery Act of 2010, although that's not too recent. You got the Brazil Clean Company Act in 2014, and then you've got some things that are in process. The most interesting one is Mexico's General Law of Administrative Accountability. It kicked over in July. Um, it was basically a real tool of existing laws and regulations that hadn't been enforced. The whole idea behind this is we're going to harmonize federal, state, and local, and then theoretically we're going to resource it and go after people who have committed bribery and corruption in Mexico. I wish my former Deloitte colleague were in the room now. Um, but it's interesting because to date they haven't really resourced it. So we'll see if this is another paper tiger program on the other side of the fence, which means a government. Um, Argentina, not exactly known for being corruption free, is considering a bill that will pen penalize corrupt business practices. We'll see if that goes anywhere. China is uh, in the middle of a multi-year effort to clean up their act. Um, it's primarily a civil statute and it regulates commercial bribery. Um, and then again, commercial and government are sort of inseparable in China, so take that for what it's worth. India tried something novel to essentially get rid of money laundering by eliminating their 500 and 1,000 rupee banknotes. And when they started getting bank filings or SARS, they discovered there's a lot of undisclosed income. Shocking, I know. Um, and, and, but they're trying to look at this as a way to fight corruption. And it, so far, it looks like it's working. France has a low Saipan II anti-bribery le legislation. Basically, it follows off the OECD and the FCPA and everything else that's going in front of it. Again, it requires a compliance program and a system to monitor it. And then South Korea, if you're following the news, uh, they impeached somebody in December of 2016 for activities that could have been related to bribery and corruption are still yet not proved. So with all the activity going on in the market, what do we do with our corporate compliance programs? So uh, sons and daughters, J.P. Morgan, I think someone else mentioned the hiring of a son, daughter, someone earlier. You do a lot of enhanced due diligence on your vendors and your third parties if you're doing this smartly because that's where most of your risk is at, around 75% if the FCPA is your uh, yardstick. However, we don't do a whole lot of diligence on our employees, the people who are actually supposedly operating all these controls. And we've seen a lot of mistakes where um, employee theft or employee bribery is not uncommon. I, on, not, on a non-bribery topic, we had an accounting clerk steal a million dollars from a private club because nobody was paying attention. Had they done a background check on this young lady, they would have found out that this was not her first offense. And I uh, have another uh, instance where a law firm uh, had a significant amount of money stole beyond their policy limits. Uh, same thing. Women had went from one firm to the next. See, women are smarter than men. They, they get away with it. I don't know. We're not, we can't keep up. Um, travel and entertainment, it was mentioned before. This is a... Um, where your data analytics come in because two lunches a year, four lunches a year, how do you track it, how do you know, how do you know you're getting anything from it? And it's usually low dollar amount. So it has to occur with some regularity to generate a favor that will get you a quid pro quo. Uh, third party due diligence and monitoring is a very hot topic. Most of the time, folks have some uh, terms and conditions in their contract which will allow them to have audit rights or periodically visit a third party, review their books and records. About 95% of the folks don't do anything with that. And what gets them in trouble in, I've helped pave the road for the government on a couple of cases is, the data is within your own systems. You didn't notice that their sales spiked, that they got a new contract that 
didn't look right and you guys got ignored it, their volume went up significantly, you were happy, and then you find out there's been a bribery or some other form of corruption related to one of your suppliers when their sales quadruple in a year, or their sales keep going up and the market's going down. So there's a lot of obvious ways that you data mine your own data and you can get around some of these or at least make some of these issues less surprising when you've actually got an allegation. Or more likely than not, you stumble into it. Because if you're an ACFE or Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, you know that most of these things are found by accident. So I'd like to tell you these systems work and the red flags are obvious and there's smart people everywhere, but most of the time we stumble on it. And somebody wakes up or somebody smart looks at something and goes, wait a minute, that, that can't be right because this doesn't match this. So there's a lot of accidental. So hot topics, GOJ, for the US, the DOJ pilot program is con continuing, which is again, if you voluntary self-disclose, there's a significant reduction in the fines and penalties. Uh, the individual mandate continues, and that's the US focus on individuals responsible as part of the Yates memo. Jurisdiction continues to be a broad interpretation. Most of your banking has some connection to the US, so therefore the U.S. can assert, assert jurisdiction. Successor liability. Um, if you inherit a bad problem because you failed to do adequate due diligence, you own it. Uh, go ahead, you have a question? This is about India. Uh, they had a, uh, an issue there with a third party who received a payment that they could not, the company could not justify, but they couldn't prove there was anything wrong with it. There was just a likelihood that this amount was used for bribery because it was not in line with what? Peers, his peer group. The individual was making a bigger commission than everybody else and not by one or two percentage points but a multiple. So there's a high probability that he was being used even though the government couldn't prove it. Um, the whistleblower activities, the thing people forget about whistleblowers in, in addition to um, trying to do the right thing, they're also getting financially rewarded now. I believe there's 85 whistleblowers that have uh, received financial compensation. So it's no longer a matter of you can ignore the uh, greasy wheel or the squeaky wheel in your organization and that will never hurt you. Now people are finding out a way to monetize their uh, disgruntled um, attitude, if you will, or the fact that you've ignored them and haven't addressed the problem. Most people will try and play by the rules and try and go through your process. And once, and once you eliminate the idea that there's a level playing field, that everybody's being treated the same and they start to see disparate treatment, either with vendors, suppliers, anybody, you create an environment where you're going to create a whistleblower or you're going to create an environment that's, that where they rationalize it if they're doing it for their own self-benefit and they're putting the company at risk at the same time. So a lot of people, the tone at the top, yeah, it's important. Tone at the middle and tone at the bottom are the most important thing. Don't forget where the rubber meets the road people who interact with your, your third-party sales representatives, and in the field, these are the people making the most important decisions. Hopefully you've trained them and that you've thoroughly background che checked them so they know the difference between right and wrong, or you've at least made sure that they understand the consequences should they stray too far afield. Uh, foreign officials, state-owned entities, and, uh, and related um, entities, you'll be surprised what a state-owned entity is when you get into Latin America, Africa and some of the other far-flung jurisdictions, the government owns or someone in the government or related to a government family owns a lot. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is probably the best example of that, but if you get into Africa and some of those jurisdictions, there's really six or eight families who run the country. Um, Peru, I lived there for two and a half years, there's probably 30. Um, not a bad thing, it's not a chable like Korea, but it's close, and if you don't know who those players are and you lack the context and the understanding, it will hurt you. So, continuous improvements. I'm moving along quickly because I know you guys want lunch. Um, compliance program essentials. Um, I, we talked a little earlier about not understanding what your compliance program is supposed to cover, where your risks are at. Creating that matrix is a nice shortcut that'll help you with that. And that's just saying what, you're, what um, mapping your regulatory requirements to your current compliance program, making sure basically you've covered everything off. It's not rocket science. Most of the time it's done on an Excel file. But if you ask your attorneys to do that, you'll get a blank look and then a very frustrated look because what they hate more than accountants is Excel. And uh, they want to write a paragraph and I want two sentences and a checkbox. Not really a checkbox, but we'll go there. Corporate culture is important. Um, compliance as an integrated function, my previous speaker here said that. 
and the culture of compliance. A compliance program takes decades or years to build and less than a week to destroy in certain circumstances. What is it, uh, the great saying that, uh, let's see, culture eats uh, strategy for breakfast or something like that, a Deming one. Um, it, it is very true. Once your, once your culture starts to go sideways on you and people start to justify their action or rationalize what they're doing, you've lost. And it takes a major shakeup in the organization and a major investment to fix it. And it is not something you recover from quickly. And hopefully you recover from it before you have an incident, not after. Otherwise, you'll pay me and a bunch of lawyers and the compliance chief and a bunch of other folks to fix it for you. Um, independent compliance function with appropriate reporting structure. This is more important in large organizations and it's more important because although we'd like to have a global compliance program that's the same everywhere, you should have a half a dozen policies that are global. Everything else should be regional and localized because it's all different. And you have to have smart people who know what the general rules are, knows where the rails are at on the railroad, and then can play within those and make informed decisions about what, what can and can't be done, what is a violation, is not a violation. And you have to have open lines of communication and a, a lack of a fear for asking those questions. Somebody mentioned Africa before, and I mentioned it a moment ago. Uh, when I was down in Nigeria, the mobile police provided security protection for uh, basically everybody getting to and from work in one piece. You know, the, the rules aren't too high. You go to work healthy, you go home healthy. Theoretically, nothing should happen in the middle to, to make that uh, change. Well, it's a mining client, so sometimes bad things happen. But so we're paying the local police chief or the commander a fee to make sure that our people get there and back safe. Is that a bribery of a foreign, a foreign government official? Am I bribing him? He's providing a service to me. If I don't pay him, what happens to my people? Did I get a quid pro quo? Is health a quid pro quo? Is that really obtaining and retaining business? So most of the people get down the rabbit hole too far. That kind of thing we explained to the SEC and the DOJ, they allowed it. They're like, yeah, that's kind of silly. I don't know why we're having this conversation. We're having this conversation because we were paying a directly paying a government official who was paying his team, and he rotated through. So we had to explain what it was, why it was OK, and why this wasn't anything to do with business. However, you get the guy down the street at the next mine who's not doing it, his operations are getting interrupted. Now I have a competitive advantage because I've learned how to play by the rules. So now here comes the gray area. Who's right, who's wrong? Am I paying somebody off? Is that benefiting me? My mind's open. I don't have death threats on all my employees. Is that a competitive advantage? I didn't think so, but maybe it's because I've lived in Latin America and played Nigeria and want to go home at the end of the day. Um, in, we've already talked about incentives and disciplines. Uh, continuous improvement and adequate monitoring. This is where data mining and big data is going to be the next hot topic or should be a topic uh, right now for you folks. If you're not paying attention to your own data, believe me, when the DOJ and the SEC or any other organization shows up, they will be because it is the easiest way to find out whether those 12 meals over two years added up to 12 meals, a trip, a conference sponsorship, and a Rolex watch that got expensed over 12 time, months. Whether that $6,000 night out was reasonable or not, because there were two people there or 25. And the, if you don't have that information, the government's going to assume the worst. And then they're going to start looking at your numbers. And then I'm going to start looking at your numbers. And I'll be like, guys, this great, big, nice policy you had didn't work because you let somebody else get away with it because you didn't have the adequate controls and the adequate backups and the adequate um, monitoring that you should have had in place. So risk assessment with data analytics, qualitative and quantitative. We helped an organization that was in the shipping industry in the Leeward and Windward Islands uh, in the Caribbean. And when the audit function came in, they said, well, what's your FCPA risk assessment look like? He said, well, that's a CPI index, right? I'm like, that's part of it. How many of these ports do you operate in? All of them. Do you own any of these operations? Not sure. OK. Long story short, we get down. We're looking at, there's allegations that we're repairing, we were paying rather expediting fees to the ports so that our goods got cleared on time. You know how a port works. You show up late, it, it stacks up all the ships behind it. You have perishables or you have a schedule. Your boat parked in waiting off dock or out in the bay to be unloaded is an expensive proposition. 
Long story short, we're down there interviewing people in this very nice conference room when the sun is beautiful outside, and we're trying to figure out why the guy across the table is getting so pissed off at me. He's like, I don't understand what you're asking. I said, well, I, I want to understand why you're paying these payments. What's the schedule? Is it a government schedule that, you know, if the guy works on Saturday, he gets 150% of the normal fee? Is that normal? He's like, I don't understand. It's in the compliance manual. Okay, can I show the compliance manual? They had gone the opposite way of documentation and documenting the amount they paid the guy in excess of his normal fee in violation of the government record, and they had documented it into a memo in a, in a subsection of a table, which, okay, was bad. And then we found out, well, I don't pay him, I pay his wife. I'm like, well, okay, well, his wife's getting paid for, like, all this crew. Oh, yeah, that's, he's a supervisor. They all... Long story short, they thought they were doing nothing wrong because it was documented in the policy. They were paying a rate. They had tickets where they checked off every container that they've done. So they were sure they were paying him the right amount pursuant to the schedule. What is the problem? Why are you here? You got to forget everything's got to be fit into a context and you have to make sure that you're paying attention when these things happen. He was mad. We bought him a beer. He was, he was okay afterwards. Resources and experience. The last thing you want is somebody green out there doing this for the first time. And that gets into adequate compliance resources, picking the right people for the job, picking senior people who can make the judgment call in the market they're at, they're in rather, and have the requisite experience and familiarity with what is and isn't permitted, both within local jurisdiction and laws and regulation, and as an organization that they represent. And this is where you don't want to cheap out. We've seen a lot of, I've seen personally seen a lot of places where the compliance officer was also the human resources officer, was also the uh, health safety and environment officer, and essentially their job for the compliance was there was a book on the shelf that they pulled down if somebody had a question. Not necessarily a bad thing, but you want someone slightly more engaged and paying slightly more attention to what was going on in the organization, and someone with the capabilities to work with, yes, accountants, and yes, attorneys, and who is comfortable swimming in that pond. Uh, because you don't want this to be a part-time effort uh, if you can avoid it. Okay? Adequate training and systems investments is another thing. Again, you, you can't track every expense report if they're done in Excel. You need to start investing in some relatively vanilla systems that'll help you keep an eye on this. And I was reviewing last week manual expense reports, believe it or not. And uh, it was a major organization, and they had problems. Um, and I couldn't believe. I'm like, well, why don't you just send me the download from Concur or, or one, of, you know, one of the other major uh, systems, and just, I'll do, put it in an SQL database. We'll do the analysis. We'll tell you if there's any patterns in the data. What do you mean? Here's a PDF. Doesn't help me. Doesn't help you either, because it tells me right now you know nothing about your own data. OK. Compliance program essentials, um, use of available regulatory guidance. We talked about that before, or at least mentioned it. There's plenty of guidance out there now. The rule, the rule of thumb is, if you're ignorant, it's your own fault. It's not as if this stuff isn't readily available. Everybody knows how to Google. Please Google. Um, there's a lot of case studies, a lot of industry guidance. Almost every major global law firm puts out a trend update, a, a, a hot topics thing. We put out, we, I write on it regularly, a lot of my colleagues do. There's enough out there that if something's happening in this space, it's not very hard to keep yourself informed of it. But again, it requires a resource that has the time and energy and the ability to understand what they're reading and whether or not it's applicable to their organization. We've mentioned this, or some of the, the prior speaker mentioned this, the critical components of compliance program um, areas, sales activities, employee incentive programs. Um, I was with a, another, <laughs> shipping support company not too long ago. And they had the unique uh, way of saying, look, we don't want highly incentivized salespeople in the field. We think it's a bad idea. So they had the 80-20 rule, meaning it was 80% base, 20% bonus, not the other way around, which is most of your salespeople, especially overseas. Uh, it kept the overhead higher, but they had more centralized control. Centralized control to the point where if somebody wanted to go out and like, prospect a new client, it had to be cleared by corporate first. They wanted to know who it was, was it worth your time, who, they were, who were they interacting with in our space now, and had they had any issues. So they were pre-clearing sales calls. And the sales guys didn't care, because essentially it didn't impact their 
remuneration in any material way if they played by the rules. If they submitted things and, they were, and the, the, the client was rejected, they submitted their requirements. So there is a way to get around this. You just have to be slightly more creative than the average bear. Again, we've said this a couple of times, or at least I have. 75% of them involve 30 par th sorry, third parties. And then that's 96% of the cases between 2005 and 2015. So 75% since inception and over the, the most recent 10 years, or not most recent, but 2005 to 15 decade, it's 96. So if you're not paying attention to third parties, you are, you are missing the boat. So the three rules the DOJ and the SEC look at when you're talking about 30 parties, are they qualified to do what they're doing? You'd be surprised how many um, due diligence files I've reviewed where the gentleman or person had nothing to do with the industry they were um, purported to be an expert in. A lot of this happens when you have to have a sponsor in a foreign lo um, location and with the government will pick it for you or you'll have to pick it but the list is really short um, and you do have to do your homework and if you're going to select someone like that the training and investment from your, your part had better be significant because they can know nothing on day one a year in, they better understand your business as well as you do, because if it ever happens, the government's going to say, well, he knew nothing on day one. And then you say, well, we actually, yes, we know that that was a, a price of getting into the market or a barrier to entry. We overcame. We trained them. We have a rationale for that. We're, we're ongoing monitoring him, so, him or her, so we're comfortable that they're doing the right things and doing the right things on behalf of our organization. The, uh, the other thing is, you know, follow the money. Again, I'm an accountant. I apologize. Fake invoices, charitable contributions, exploiting expenses. Charitable contributions are getting more and more complicated because it's hard to find out who's related to who, simply because a lot of it's not disclosed or it's uh, not monitored at all. Uh, measuring in the use of KPI, KPIs or key performance indicators in data analytics. Um, when you look at data analytics, there's two things, activity versus impact. Activity will get you nowhere. Impact is what you should be monitoring. So what is activity and what is impact? Activity is your 96.6% trained on your, one, on your annual FCPA training module. Nobody cares. It's, it's a nice check the box exercise. It doesn't really tell you whether your program's operating effectively or not. Impact is you got a visit from a local regulator. What happened? How did you address it? Were they satisfied? Were you fined? Were you warned? Okay. Did you react to that appropriately? Even if it's just an inquiry hey, this is the local government, they're, they're going through the mining industry, they're looking at their um, royalty payments. That's an impact of compliance. They're doing an audit on you. How did you handle that? Were you able to do it smoothly and quickly and efficiently? The last thing you want to have is a bunch of activities. It, 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 shows, it does not measure the effectiveness of your program. Data analytics, data-driven remediation and monitoring activities are important. If you don't own the data, well, you actually own the data. If you don't look at the data, you're not doing yourself any favors. And you have to incorporate market-specific information. It's great. I've seen these analysis. They have their data analytics down to a fine art, and they've never compared them to anything external to their four walls. Did you realize you were up 30% in the market when the market was down 15? No. Do you realize that the volume in your market where you're selling your medical supplies is five times the need of the local government and all your clients are state-owned entities and hospitals? Are you creating a gray market? Where is this stuff going? Is it being exported into another jurisdiction that you possibly shouldn't be doing business in? These are questions that get asked only after you're in trouble that should be asked on a proactive basis. So it's something to keep in mind. And uh, yes, people have gotten burned by that one, last one. Okay, so what are compliance program essentials? You need policies and procedures, bulletins. I know PPBs is not exactly an acronym, everybody knows. And this is where we talk about the flexibility. You have to have smart people who can think on their own, who are well advised, and who have the ability to interact with all aspects of the business. You cannot have an accountant that can't get along with anybody, or an accountant who's not comfortable outside of any function other than the monthly close process in charge of your compliance function because you wanted somebody who could do the data. It doesn't work that way. You've got to have a nice, well-rounded individual. Um, but, and you have to have someone who's able to think and make informed decisions and get advice when they need to. That's critical. Focus on reasonable insurance. This is not, and I believe another speaker said that this morning, this is not absolute assurance. No one is expecting absolute insurance. 
You have declinations because your program offered reasonable assurances and you were able to find out where it went wrong and you were able to find out it went wrong on this day and I found out five days later or within a reasonable time period that some suspect activity occurred and I addressed it with my compliance program and here I am self-reporting it to you because it's a major incident. And continuous improvement. You, if you have the best program in the world six months from now it won't be because something will have happened in the market, something will have happened in your organization, or something will have happened in um, the jurisdiction where law or regulation could change. In Latin America, they change about as often as I change my socks, so please keep that in mind. Um, the former uh, DOJ Compliance Council, um, they're not gonna outsource their investigation. So no matter how good your program is, um, th they're not gonna outsource it. Okay, I'm running out of time. Um, so ISO 3701 is not a substitute for doing your homework. It's not a substitute for the government. In the U.S., it's not an affirmative defense. So why, why would you bother doing it? Um, you, have to, you have to essentially find a reason. Okay? It is great to have an independent third party look at you. It's great to have... Um, a peer or a professional in your, in your field or in the compliance field help you evaluate your program because the outside in view is not often taken into consideration and it's a phenomenal way to improve your program. It's an independent, it falls into the auditing and monitoring process. It's a best practices opportunity. The people who are probably sitting across from you doing these interviews have been doing this for more than two decades, have a lot of experience and have sat on the wrong side of the table, meaning the government if you're an employer. Uh, or have been a consultant, lawyer, or attorney for a very long time in this space. So they're a wealth of knowledge. You need to figure out how to um, leverage that. It's another tool that proposes systemic review. So a holistic review of your ABAC pro anti-bribery and anti-corruption program. The ISO 3700 is a standard. They're trying to basically say, do you have the components of the program? And how are you measuring whether or not that component is operating effectively and efficiency? Those are good questions to get asked when they're not being asked by a regulator. Because if you get the answer wrong, you get a little net that says you should improve your program, not we're going to fine you, or you've blown this, here's the, here's the financial ramifications. Um, and it's a great opportunity to uh, get your third party certified. Because I know contract terms and conditions are wonderful, and everybody can probably recite from heart the FCPA clause or the anti-bribery and anti-corruption clause that's in your third party contract, says thou shalt not bribe, or something along those lines. It's nice to see that they've got more than that and they've got more than your training and that they actually understand it and the ramifications to both them and you. And that's pretty important. Um, at least in my book, that's a nice bang for the buck. Again, not an affirmative defense, but it will help you. And thank you very much. I hopefully am right on time so I didn't keep you from lunch. Thank you. Any questions? I'm around. I don't want to stop you from lunch.